All right, well, we made it just in time, it looks like. Let me make sure that that really does go. All right, yay. Let me turn your audio up. And we can go live. Yay! <laughs> we made it in time. All right, let me turn your audio up. Hopefully that works for everybody. And yay, we've got a there we go in the chat room. <laughs> I mean, this is the way we do things in open source. We do them live, right? Learn as you go. Learn live. Learn as we go. I think I am taking up a lot of space here with my chat window. I'm like all up in your face. So let me make that a little bit smaller. I am not the star of the show. All right. So it has been only one week since we last met. Hopefully everyone has had time to review the slides and like do their homework. I have to admit, I'm a little bit behind, but I started working on learning VPCs about this morning, so I'm catching up. <laughs> um, so how would you like to start us off today, Christoph? Well, so we, we did have homework assignments, like you mentioned last week, and one of those was to go over a quiz question. And so we're gonna start off like we did last study group, by answering that quiz question from the AWS Cloud Practitioner sample question set, that PDF document. And then after that, we're going to cover Amazon EC2 and VPC. So I'm glad that you had the ability and chance to take a look at VPC a little bit this morning. There, there is a lot of information that we have to cover in this study group. So I'm gonna do my best to go through the, the most important areas of both EC2 and VPC and, and see how it goes. So I'm really excited. These are two very important topics, but also topics that I like to, to talk about and work with a lot. So this is one of the study groups that I'm, I'm the most excited for, and hopefully everybody attending is also really excited about this. Okay, all right. Let me make sure that um, everybody has sound on their end. Uh, okay, yeah, we just got a few people saying no sound, but then most people saying yes. So maybe we'll just take it a bit slower here just to make sure that everybody does their own audio checks. <laughs> yeah, of course. Definitely want people to hear, so. <laughs> All right, so people are saying that sound is a bit rough for some people, but, oh, the joy of streaming. Luckily, we're gonna be going to slides pretty soon, which should nix the um, sync between lips and sound. So, all right, I think we're good to go, Kristoff. All right, let's give it a shot. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And let me know when you see it, please. All right, I think we see your screen now. Great. Now in, in this study group, similar to the previous study group, we are going to have some slides to go over concepts, important concepts, but then I'm going to jump into the AWS console so that we can see how that's applied in the real world. How do we take those concepts and actually apply them in the AWS console so that we know what we're doing beyond just passing the certification exam. So. I am going to start with the concepts because there's a lot of different concepts that we have to make sure we understand. And then right after that, we'll jump into the console. As I mentioned, we are going to be talking about a lot of different topics in this specific study group. So I may have to curb some of the, the questions that come through. Please don't hesitate to ask questions, even if I can't get to it in this study group. Please join our Slack channel, and I've got more information about that at the end, so that you can ask that question in the Slack channel, and I can take more time to answer the questions there. So don't hesitate to ask, even if I don't get to it now, join the Slack channel, and, and we'll definitely make sure that you get your questions answered. Still good on the audio and video? Yep, everything has awesome. sinking in well. Great, so we had homework, a homework quiz assignment for question number seven in that Cloud Practitioner document. And the question was, how would a system administrator add an additional layer of login security to a user's AWS management console? We covered this in the prior study group, so hopefully you got the answer right. If not, and you don't know why this is the correct answer, please let us know. Again, let's join that Slack channel and make sure that we understand all the different questions and answers and why certain answers are correct and others are not. That way you can prep for the certification exam. But in this case, it is to enable multi-factor authentication that adds that extra layer of protection when you're logging in to either a root account or even IAM user accounts. So that's very important to enable. And by the way, this is also important to enable outside of AWS. If, if you have the ability to do so in other services like your email and other things like that, I highly recommend that you take this step to secure your resources on the internet. 
All right, let's just dive right in since we are limited on time. What I'm going to start with primarily is Amazon EC2. We're gonna go through those concepts and then move on to the VPC and then jump into the console. The reason I'm starting with EC2 is because it's such a core service to Amazon Web Services. Even if you've never used AWS, you probably have heard of EC2 before. If you have used AWS, chances are you've, you've done a little bit with it or at least looked at it in the AWS console. And there's so many different things in that service you can do that it's important to make sure that you understand the foundations of it before you jump in and start creating resources so that you don't get in trouble with those resources. But the main thing that we're going to cover here is EC2 instances. Now, EC2 instances are really virtual computers or servers. It's as if you had your laptop computer or a desktop computer that's in the cloud and that you're able to access from virtually anywhere in the, in the world as long as you have internet access. And you're just paying or leasing that software and hardware uh, in order to have access to it. So you don't have to go out to say Best Buy or Amazon.com or anywhere like that and buy the computer and have it installed at your house. You can just create these EC2 instances and have direct access almost instantaneously to those computer resources which is fantastic because if you think back to the first study group that we had, which was regarding some of the benefits between on-premises and the AWS cloud or cloud in general, it's that ability to have on-demand resources. If you need more computational power, you just spin it up within seconds or minutes and you have access to it right away versus on-premises, you have to purchase that equipment, set up that equipment and so on. And EC2 is a major driving force in giving you that flexibility as an individual or as an organization. And that means that with EC2, you can fulfill a number of different use cases. One of those use cases is, is having or hosting web servers or web applications, whether that's PHP, Ruby, Python, doesn't matter. It's, it's agnostic in that sense of, it doesn't care what you run on it. Anything that you could run on an operating system or on a computer, you can run on these EC2 instances for the most part. Another really popular work or, uh, use case that you might see is customer managed databases. I say customer managed databases because in the next study group, we are going to talk about uh, other types of managed services that are available on AWS, like Amazon RDS and Aurora, and how they differ from your EC2 databases that you could install, that you could configure and administer on your own, and the pros and cons between those, but that's completely within the realm of EC2 possibilities. And then a final use case that I put on here, but this is by no means all the use cases, is just really any workloads that require compute power. Because if you look on the right-hand side, some of the EC2 instance components that we have are going to be an operating system. Think of Linux, Windows, Mac OS, things like that. Instance type, where you can choose things like the processing power or CPU. You can select what power you need and why, depending on your use case. EBS, which is storage, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. IP address and internet access and security groups. We'll talk about security in VPC and EC2. And then of course, RAM, which is another thing you can control by selecting the instance type. So you can basically tweak what you want with these EC2 instances for more or less power. That obviously changes the cost that you would have to pay as well. And speaking of purchasing options, this is an important concept to keep in mind. I've been talking a lot about on-demand, which is that pay-as-you-go model. You spin up the, the, the resource, you use it for a couple hours, you get billed for those two hours. You don't get billed for a year up front. And that's the on-demand model. But if you do have specific workloads that you know are going to be running for at least a year, if not more than a year, you do have another purchase option, which is called reserved instances. And reserved instances have baked in discounts. So if you do know you're going to need those resources for X period of time, then you can use reserved instances to lower your costs. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. And the final purchase option that we'll talk about here is spot instances. And you'll see how that's different from both in-demand and reserved instances for even steeper discounts, but it does have some cons attached to it. So moving on from that, let's dive in a little bit more into reserved instances, because this is something that you might expect to see on the Cloud Practitioner certification exam. Like I said, you can buy reserved instances for EC2, and that gives you capacity reservations, but also bakes in some of those discounts because you're, you're committing to a longer term. Instead of saying, I'm going to pay hourly for these EC2 resources, you're saying, I'm committing to paying for that year or three years. And oftentimes you can pay for that upfront or in partial payments and things like that. But within reserved instances specifically, you have three different types that we're going to talk about here. The first one is called standard reserved instances. 
as the name implies, these are pretty standard and you can expect up to 75% discounts on on-demand prices. And you buy those, you use them for that year or three year commitment and you get that discount. It's, it's pretty straightforward. But AWS also came out with a different type of reserved instance called convertible reserved instances. The reason they came out with convertible reserved instances is because if you have a use case where you're using a certain instance instance type, EC2 instance type, and you're, you're, you think you're only going to need that for a year, but halfway through the year, you realize that your application requirements have evolved and you need more computational power, instead of being locked into that lower instance type or lower grade instance type, you need to upgrade that instance type, but you still want to benefit from reserved instance pricing, you can use convertible reserved instances because those can be exchanged for either equal value or greater value instances. Meaning if you're using one that costs, let's just throw out a number, a dollar per hour, and you're moving to one that costs a dollar fifty per hour, then you would be able to convert that reserved instance without having to, to, let, to, to lose the money investment that you have up front. Of course, that does come as a trade-off. You get a little bit less of a discount with that since you do have additional flexibility. The last reserved instance type that we'll talk about before I pause and ask for questions is called scheduled reserved instances. So these reserved instances are interesting because if, if you only need that capacity reservation and, and cost savings for a scheduled period of time, like maybe on a weekly basis, daily basis between a specific period of, of time or something like that, you can use scheduled reserved instances for that use case and still get some, some discounts in some cases uh, as opposed to on-demand instances. So those are the three different types. Again, as I've mentioned, you have either one or three year commitments. You can pay it partially upfront, fully upfront. There's different models like that. And also, as I mentioned, you get those cost savings, but also capacity savings. So if you know that you're going to need to scale up to a certain number and you wanna make sure that EC2 has enough capacity to handle your workload, which it should, but you never know, sometimes they might run out. By buying those reserved instances, you can kind of reserve some of that capacity in the AWS cloud for your EC2 resources. And also an important distinction is they, these reserved instances can be purchased and assigned to either one specific availability zone or multiple availability zones in a region. So you can just buy it region-wide or availability zone-wide if you do want to. So that's it for reserved instances. Before I move on, are there any questions about these different options for reserved instances or even on-demand uh, EC2 instances? So we have one question and then a little bit of clarity. Um, the first question is, are we assuming, or you know, is it true, that standard RIs are not as elastic? What do you mean by elastic? So DJ DC, if you can add a little bit of clarity to your question, that might be great. And in the meantime, um, so the clarity is, so reserve instances have to be purchased with at least one year at a time. Um, does this mean that they can also have like one year or three year contracts or are we only doing one year contracts? You could do one or three year contracts. So if you know you'll use them for a year, but not sure for three years, you could do the one year. If you know you're going to use that capacity, for three years, then you can buy the three years and you get much steeper discounts by, by going that way. Oh, okay. I'm um, going to turn up your, they're saying that we're having some audio on your end. Okay. I turned up your audio a little bit. Um, okay. okay. So just before we move on, my guess would mean that they're going from the term elastic previously, meaning that we could shrink down or shrink up based on the usage that we needed. Uh, so using our eyes would basically mean that we kind of kill some of this elastic ability. Great question. And, and the answer is no, you do not. So the one of the interesting things about reserved instances is it's kind of like a label in the sense that you're not really buying instances. You're just buying a label that tells AWS, if I run these instances that match that reservation I purchased, give me my discount. If I don't run the instance type that I bought the purchase the uh, reserved instance for, you can still run those instances, but you're not going to get a discount for it. So a good use case to think about is if you, and we'll talk about the different instance types, so bear with me, but if you have a T2 micro instance that you buy a, or you're running T2 micro instances, but you purchase reserved instances for an M4 extra large instance, and you never launch M4 extra large instances, then you're wasting your money because 
you paid up front for that capacity, but you're not actually using that capacity. And so think back to the prior study group, if you were part of that, and of the cost and tools and budgeting tools that we talked about, it's important to make sure that your team understands how to use those to analyze and make sure that your reserved instance purchases are being used properly, otherwise you're just wasting money. But if you are using them properly, you can get significant discounts. So you can still run whatever instances you want outside of reserved instances. You're just buying those reserved instances. And if you happen to use that capacity type or that uh, instance type, then you'll get discounts for it, if that makes sense. It does. And the last question we have is, so let's say that you purchase one of these reserves. Does it roll from month to month? Is there a monthly quota that you have to use up? Or as long as you've used up within a year, you're doing great? So it is the, in the case of the year commitment, again, mm -hmm. you're just buying that, that reservation, let's say four M4 large instances. And if you use four M4 large instances all the time, then you'll reap the benefits of it. If you only use two M4 large instances, it doesn't matter if you use it on a monthly or yearly basis, you're not going to get the full benefit of those reserved instances. So think of it more as a label than a set instance that you're buying. Does that make sense? That does. All right, guys, keep asking questions. I know some of them seem to be a little redundant, but sometimes, you know, when we hear things explained in different ways, it just helps solidify yeah. that later so we can use it on. All right, I and think and I'll try to, sorry, I'll, I'll try to show that in the console to see if it makes a little bit more sense once we're actually walking through it versus just conceptually. Right. No, thank you very much. The last purchase option that we, we talked about is spot instances. So this is the third one. And the thing with spot instances is even though you can get significant discounts, like up to 90% off on-demand prices, this only works with very specific use cases because spot instances are not reliable in the sense that you turn it on and you turn it off whenever you want. You can turn them on, but they may turn off at a moment's notice. Like they, they only give you a short window of time saying, hey, AWS needs these resources. We're going to cut them off. So you have to have workloads that are able to withstand failure and or, or fault tolerant so that they can pick back up where they left off when their resources become available again. Basically, EC2 spot instances are AWS's way of making money off of instances that are not being used at the moment. But if a customer, let's say Netflix, has huge influx because they're launching this, the next season of Stranger Things, even though there's no more seasons, but whatever, for the sake of example, and people are just flooding in, and so Netflix is scaling up dynamically, they're going to grab more EC2 instances, at which point AWS might tell you, hey, we need these resources back to give to this other customer. Of course, they won't tell you which customer, so we're going to shut them off. And so again, you have to have very specific workloads that can handle that kind of failure. Otherwise, you can't use spot instances, and that's why they're significantly cheaper. So those are just three uh, use cases that you might consider when thinking about spot instances. I'm going to move on to a couple of quiz questions, pop quizzes that cover these topics. And then after that, if you do still have questions for spot instances, let me know and I'll, I'll answer them. So first pop quiz question, you're running, whoop, let me move this out of the way. You're running 10 M4 large instances and you plan to keep those running for at least a year. However, you may need to increase the instance size after about four months. What can you purchase to reduce costs yet remain flexible? Is it flexible reserved instances, upgradable reserved instances, standard, or convertible reserved instances? We're going to go ahead and let people get their answers in as they do. I'm going to pop back on the screen to show you guys the, uh, I guess, the swag this time is from our friends at Jupiter Broadcasting. You can get a user error sticker and a choose Linux sticker. The answers that we have coming in right now are, oh, we've got a little bit divided. First answer was C. We're getting some Ds in the mix. So we'll give you guys just, oh, oh more. okay, it looks like Ds got it. I don't know if people are copying or if they really think <laughs> D is it, but <laughs> who's going to be our winner, Kristoff? D is going to be the winner, convertible reserved instances. Yay, Blade Gillette, make sure to DM me and we'll get these stickers on your way. If you got this wrong, make sure to download the slideshow so you can go back through those notes that we just walked through. And if it still doesn't make sense, please reach out on Slack and I'll be glad to explain further. So the next question is you're running a workload on AWS that can be interrupted, but that needs to work at massive scale. Which instance type would be the best option for this workload in order to minimize cost? Is it convertible reserved instances, spot instances, 
on-demand instances or scheduled reserved instances. All right, CTKR wants these stickers. They answered before you were even done reading, but it looks like we've got split answers again. We've got some Bs, we've got some Ds. Come on, guys. Maybe I'll be friendly and give them to two people. I don't know. We've got lots of stickers. All right, it looks like B is going to take the cake. Are they right? Yep, B, B is correct. Spot instances, think back to that keyword interrupted. So because I threw in that keyword in the question of interrupted, for that workload to be interrupted and, and fault tolerant and be able to pick back up where it left off, to get the largest discount, it would be spot instances. If you can't handle the interruption, then convertible reserve instances might be the best option, uh, if, especially if you don't have that option for spot instances. Awesome. Any questions before we move on to VPCs? Again, we'll jump back into the console in a moment after walking through VPC, and we'll actually show you how to launch that EC2 instance and walk you through that on the console side. But it is important to understand VPCs before we do that. So any questions so far about EC2? I think we're doing good. And for those of you that won, make sure to check your DMs for instructions on how to get your swag. I also get swag, right? I got stickers, right? I mean, you're going to have to visit at some point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, VPCs. VPCs are a beast of a topic. We're not going to cover anything. or uh, not cover. We're not going to cover too much into VPC, just some very important concepts that you have to understand to, one, use EC2, and two, to pass the exam. But there's a lot that goes into VPC, and that gets covered in more advanced AWS certification exams. This is a really important topic as well. At a high level, a VPC is a private section of AWS where you can place your AWS resources, like EC2 instances that we just talked about, or things like databases or really other resources as well. And you have complete control over who can access those resources. Basically think of this as your slice of the AWS cloud where you can control who goes in and out and what happens with your resources inside of that slice of AWS cloud. And within VPC, the important concepts that we're going to cover today are subnets, gateways like internet, NAT, and virtual gateways, as well as VPC security, including NACLs, security groups, and flow logs. Now, I took this, this little illustration here on the right-hand side from Tia's AWS Cloud Practitioner Certification Exam Prep course on Linux Academy because I think it's such a great way to convey what VPCs are at a higher level, illustrative level, uh, if you're that kind of person that learns that way as I am, as am I. But basically, if you're looking at this, what looks like a neighborhood here, you've got roads, you've got cars, you've got houses, they're subdivided. So think of this as a subdivision or a neighborhood. And this entire neighborhood here could be your VPC. So this is your VPC in AWS Cloud. Within that VPC are things called subnets. And those subnets have houses. So this street here is a subnet within your greater VPC that has three different houses. This one has two houses. This one has th or six houses if we want. Basically, you can slice and dice this however you'd like, and we'll explain some of the benefits of that or why you would do it a certain way in a moment. But these houses could be your EC2 resources or databases or, or whatever else you're launching in here that are added inside of a subnet, and you could have multiple different subnets in your VPC. You can control the traffic that comes in and out. You could have gates and say, these cars are allowed, these cars aren't allowed. That way you have complete control over the traffic going inside of your VPC and moving around your VPC as well. So I touched on subnets, but let's break it down a little bit further. Subnets, or quote unquote subnetwork, is a subsection of, or subsection of a network, in this case of a VPC network. So after you create that VPC in AWS, you can structure the VPC with those subnets we talked about. And how you structure those is honestly completely up to you. It depends on your use case, best practices, and things like that. But you do have two different types of subnets. You have a public subnet, which means it's accessible from the open internet. And then you have private subnets. And we'll talk about what makes a public versus private subnet and why that's important. And the other thing to keep in mind as well is we talked about availability zones and regions in the first study group. And this is where we can start to apply some of those concepts because subnets can go across availability zones within the same region. So if I'm launching in North Virginia, I can launch four different subnets. I could have two subnets in one availability zone, two subnets in another availability zone, or all four of them could be a different availability zones if I wanted to structure it that way. 
That's important because it increases high availability of your applications if you do it right, and it creates fault tolerance. If an entire availability zone goes down, the other one can stay alive and keep your application serving customers. So this is a pretty important topic. Before I move on and dive into that a little bit more into detail, I do want to point out that if you're looking at these two subnets here, and we could say this is a public subnet and this maybe is a private subnet, but inside of those subnets, you have three and three houses. Each of those houses has a street address, right? A number, an address, a zip code, a country code, things like that. That's how you identify whose house it is or where that house is around the world. Well, compute, computing resources in VPCs also have an, address, an address. It's called an IP address. You've probably heard of IP addresses in the past, I'm sure. But in this case, you can have IP addresses and will have IP addresses for each individual resource or house, as we're uh, metaphorically demonstrating here. And so this address, this house would have an IP address that tells the VPC where to route traffic. So if a request comes in for that specific computer, it grabs the IP address and says, oh, this is for this computer and back and forth. Now, because this is a public subnet, it could receive traffic from the open internet, but this private subnet cannot. And we'll talk about that in more detail. So it would have to go through the public subnet in order to access the private subnet. So that is also an important topic to understand when it comes to securing your VPC resources. Christoph, now, before you move on, yes. could you speak uh -huh. a little bit to the use of the use cases of subnets? For example, we had the question of would you use different subnets for dev testing production or why use subnets? You know? <laughs> yeah, and I will get to that and I think the next slide or in two slides. So okay. let's definitely table that topic and I'll, I'll get right back to it because that's a really good question. Before we do that, though, let's quickly talk about what makes a subnet public, because we do have to talk about gateways. Gateways are topics you could expect to see on the exam. And because there are multiple different types of gateways, it can really trip you up when they're asking you questions or if they ask you questions about gateways. But the difference between a public subnet and a private subnet really comes down to one thing, internet gateways. So if you have an internet gateway, which is a combination of both hardware and software, but you don't really have to mess with the hardware yourself because AWS takes care of that, it provides your net, your private network, excuse me, your networks with a route to the open internet. And that should actually say public. I don't know why I put private here. That should say public. Because the private subnets won't have routes going to the internet gateway. Therefore, they can't be accessed from the open internet. But a public subnet that does have a route going through to the internet gateway makes it become public because then public, or public traffic from the open internet can be routed to that public subnet thanks to the internet gateway. And that's done through a route table, which is a more advanced topic that we won't cover for this exam. But if you play around with VPCs, you absolutely have to understand route tables. So if you are curious, definitely check those out. So to, to get back to your, your answer or your question from earlier, if we look at it from a diagram perspective, because I love diagrams, I love visualizing things, it helps me understand it. If you're looking at the open internet here, you have an internet gateway, then you have a public subnet, a private subnet, and another private subnet. All of this lives within your VPC. So again, you create the VPC, and then you can slice and dice that VPC however you'd like. In this case, this is a pretty good example of a well-architected uh, platform, although we'll talk about some of the downsides of this approach. But in this case, you have one public subnet that's accessible from the open internet, and then you have the private subnets. Usually what you'll see is that most of your resources live in the private subnets. Unless it needs access to the open internet, you really should not put that in the public subnet because then you're, you're increasing the attack vectors that you could have on your resources. By having them in a private subnet, it makes it much harder for potential attackers to be able to even access those resources in the first place. So how you structure this is kind of up to you and your use case. I've seen multiple different ways that people use this for development or testing environments. But oftentimes, if you're thinking it, about it at a higher level, you might have web servers here, or in this case, they have web app firewalls that then direct traffic and requests through what's called a load balancer. And we won't really talk about it too much in this, uh, in this uh, study group, but load balancers basically distribute requests between resources. So in this case, you have two web app firewalls. The load balancer determines, okay, I'm going to send traffic to this one or send it to that one, depending on the number of different factors. Once it goes to the load balancer, then goes through the web app firewall, it checks to make sure that the traffic is allowed to go through. 
goes back to a private elastic load balancer that then sends traffic between private instances. So the traffic again has to go through the public subnet before it can go through to the private subnets. We will talk about ways of connecting your on-premises resources to private subnets so that you don't have to go through the open internet in order to access those. So there are ways to get around that, but the beauty of it is you have complete control over how you set that up. And it really depends on the use case as well. Does that answer your question a little bit? I know we'll reinforce this a little bit more as we go through it, um, but hopefully that starts answering it a little bit. And I think you did a great job of explaining that. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Are there any other questions so far? Nope. So far, you have laid this out really clearly. Thanks. Oh, awesome. Thank you. So the, the reason I say that, and I think this is mostly just how they, they diagrammed it, but the reason I say that this is not the best well-architected framework you could have is because they don't show how this can be applied across multiple availability zones. So in this case, they just have a public subnet with the resources. What you would really want to increase that high availability and fault tolerance is to have your subnets across availability zones. In this case, we have one public subnet in one availability zone and a private subnet in another availability zone. What would be even better is to have one public subnet in this availability zone, one public subnet in this availability zone, and then one private here and one private one there. The reason for that is because now if I have application servers or instances running across these two availability zones, and I have that load balancer distributing traffic between them, if something does happen to AWS's availability zone, like it gets completely wiped out off the planet, maybe a, a tsunami or hurricane comes through, or, or earthquake or whatever, and just destroys that data, that availability zone there, your application can still run because it's across a different availability zone. If you don't do that and you only have resources in one availability zone and that availability go zone goes down, there's nothing you can do about it. Your application is going to be down. And unless you have backups, your application is going to be down for however long AWS takes to recover that availability zone. And they should have backups, but you may also lose work, right? So that's why you do want to separate this out across at least two availability zones and or more if you can't afford to do that. Because keep in mind, if you launch a resource here and you launch a resource there, now you have redundancy, which is great for fault tolerance and high availability, but now you have to pay double the cost for that instance. Instead of launching one instance, you're launching two, or instead of 10, you're launching 20, you're virtually doubling your cost. And that's why looking at things like reserved instances can help lower some of those costs while you do continue to increase your high availability for the application. So that is a best practice of running your applications and or resources across multiple availability zones, which you can do by creating subnets across those different availability zones. Ignore this other stuff like route tables and the other stuff for now. Just focus on the, the subnets and the availability zones. But does, it, does that make sense? Are there any questions so far? Yep, no questions yet. Keep on going. We're doing good on time today. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I thought, uh, <laughs> I thought I'd be running out of time faster. So that's good. We'll keep it at this pace as long as it's good with everyone. So we talked about the internet gateways. And again, that's the way of creating public subnets, and you can have one or more different public subnets. As long as you're routing the traffic through the internet gateway, you're going to have a public subnet. But there are other types of gateways, and they're also very important. So internet gateways are different from virtual private gateways, customer gateways, and NAT gateways. A virtual private gateway, as you recall, we talked about how if you create a VPC, you can't really access it from the open internet unless you have those public subnets. But if you have on-premises resources and you have your VPC with private subnets and private resources, and you still need those on-premises resources to access those private resources in your VPC, it'd be awesome to have a way to create a, a tunnel or a connection between the two that is secure, encrypted, and that only your people working on-premises can go through in order to access those private resources without opening up those resources to potential hacking. A way to do that is by using virtual private gateways. So you use a virtual private gateway to create that connection between your on-premises resources or network and your VPC resources and network. And you combine that with what's called a customer gateway, which lives on the on-premises side. So the, the VPG or virtual private gateway lives on the, the AWS side, the VPC side. And then the customer gateway lives on the on-premises side. And when you connect the two of them, it creates a site-to-site -site VPN connection that can be encrypt encrypted. So traffic that goes back and forth can't be snooped on or looked at and decrypted very easily. 
which increases security. Another way that you can do that, or an additional layer of security you could add on top of that, is to use something called AWS Direct Connect. AWS Direct Connect is, is pretty expensive, so it's definitely not something that you want to just try to turn on, and you couldn't do that anyway, because it, it does take some effort to set it up. But essentially, if we look at this graph here, we have the virtual private gateway again on the VPC side, and then we have the customer gateway, we have that site-to-site -site VPN connection, that works great, it's encrypted. If you need more than that and you add direct connect in the middle, you're basically connecting your on-premises router to an AWS direct connect router. And that lets you bypass the open internet ISPs. So that adds even more security and makes it even more private so that you can have that connection between your resources be even more locked down than just having the site-to-site -site VPN connection. So again, you have the virtual private gateways, you have the customer gateways, and then you have Direct Connect. And Direct Connect is awesome, but it's definitely a lot more setup time, and it has a lot of requirements that you have to go through, and it also costs a pretty penny to set up. So just, uh, just FYI, any other questions or any questions regarding the virtual private gateways, customer gateways, and or Direct Connect? We do not. However, we did have a few people join us late. So I did want to state that the slides are going to be available for you guys after the fact and will be available for questions um, on Slack. But other than that, please continue. Great. All right. I think this is the last gateway we talk about, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So the, the last gateway that I did want to cover in case you do see it on the exam, but also because it's, it's good to know about, is called a NAT gateway. So we talked about the internet gateway, and that opens up to the open internet back and forth. You can send traffic from the open internet, from your VPC to the open internet. But for those private resources that you have, you don't want that, as we talked about. But that, that, that causes a problem because if your private resources can't go outside of your VPC to fetch things like inst installing updates or upgrades or just installing software in general, then it can be a lot more difficult to administer those instances that you have. And so if you do need those instances to be able to reach out to the open internet while still preventing people from the open internet from making connections to those instances, then you can use a NAT gateway. Basically think of a internet gateway or a NAT gateway being half of what the internet gateway does. I know that's a huge oversimplification, but you're basically grabbing the internet gateway, cutting it in half. Now you have a NAT gateway that only allows connections to be made from inside your VPC instead of from the open internet inside into your VPC. Again, use cases are to install th software, updates, upgrade software. So if you're trying to upgrade um, a web server or something like that, if you have a NAT gateway set up, you'd be able to reach out and grab those packages and install them from within your VPC. Another thing that NAT gateways help with is enabling those private resources in your VPC to access other AWS resources that, are, that live outside of your VPC. For example, if you have Amazon S3 set up with buckets and data in those buckets and you need those resources to be able to reach out to S3 and, and use that information, since S3 wouldn't be living, or if S3 isn't living in your VPC, then you can use a NAT gateway for your instances to reach out to S3 and do what it needs to do uh, with that. Another way that you can accomplish that is with something called a VPC endpoint. I'm not going to cover those too much. I do recommend you look them up a little bit uh, through the documentation to fill in those gaps. But you can also achieve that specific use case I just talked about by setting up a VPC endpoint and connecting to other AWS resources, such as Route 53. So you could even set up domain names through a service called Route 53, that's AWS service, and connect that through VPC endpoints. So do keep that in mind. Any questions about gateways before we move on to security? And then after security, we will be diving into the AWS console. Nope, we're good. Awesome. That's fantastic. OK, great. Let's move on to VPC security. So we, we've already talked a little bit about security and how VPC, by its own nature, locks down things unless you try to open them up to the open internet. But that's not enough when it comes to security. You have to have other layers of security to make sure that your resources are not accessible to the wrong people, but are still accessible to the right people or resources. And to do that, there are two very important tools we can use. One of them is called a network access control list, or NACLs, or NACLs, as I've heard them referred to. I'll probably switch back and forth when I mention it. 
And then you have security groups or SGs as I like to type them out. And these essentially act as firewalls, which adds a security layer and gives you complete control over what traffic is allowed in and out of your VPC, but also moving within your VPC. So from one subnet to the next subnet, back to the next subnet, you can control all of that flow using NACLs and security groups. There's another really nifty fe uh, feature that AWS fairly recently launched called Flow Logs. And that allows you to capture information about IP traffic flowing, be flowing between your network interfaces. So between your instances or other things like that. And you can publish that information to a service called CloudWatch that we'll talk about later in a, another study group and Amazon S3. So you can run analysis against it. You can look for anything that looks fishy and your requests that shouldn't be there. And if you do spot some of that through, for example, machine learning, you can have it trigger a notification so that your security engineers can look at it and see if it is something malicious that needs to be contained or if it's just something out of the ordinary that should still be allowed. But you do have that flexibility of turning that on for extra security. It's a, it is important to understand the differences between NACLs and security groups because they serve two different purposes or in different ways, but they also need to work hand in hand to have this, the proper security protocols. So with network access control lists, one important thing to note with them is they are at the subnet level. So you can create a network access control list and then assign it to one or more subnets. Like in this diagram here, you have the network access control list, and then you have a public subnet, a public subnet, you could have private subnets, but regardless of what they are, whether they're public or private, that network access control list is what determines what traffic goes in and out of the sub subnets or between your subnets. And we do that with what's called an inbound and outbound rule. Inbound means that the traffic is incoming versus outbound means the traffic is outgoing. And with network access control lists, you have to create rules for both the inbound traffic and the outbound rules, which makes this stateless. What that means is if I have a request that's coming into my VPC and going to one of my public subnets from the open internet, if that traffic is allowed to come in, as in it's allowed to go through your, your NACL and then into your, your EC2 instance, in order for it to go back out to the open internet or where it was requested, you also have to allow that. Even though it went in, doesn't mean it, it can come out. Or even though it's going out, doesn't mean it can come in. That is one key difference between security groups and, and ACLs. With an ACLs, you have to specify both the inbound and the outbound rules that say, yes, allow this traffic, or no, deny this traffic. And in this case, we are demonstrating an example of the traffic is allowed to go in and back out. In this case, the traffic is not allowed to go in or allowed to go back out. And that can be controlled again through what's called network access control lists. The security groups are different in the sense that they're at the instance level. So here we have the NACL, here we have the security groups. So before the traffic even makes it to the security group or to the instance, of course, like we talked about, it goes through the NACL, but even once it passes by the NACL, you can still block that traffic through security groups. So think of them as two different layers of protection, the first one being the NACL and then the security group. But the main difference again is NACLs are stateless, whereas security groups are stateful, meaning that if I have traffic coming in that's allowed by the security group, it's automatically allowed to go back out. Or if I have traffic going out that's allowed by the security group, it's automatically allowed to go back in. If it's denied, same thing. So that's what they call stateful versus stateless. And that makes configuration of security groups a little bit different because you have to think about both ways with, with NACLs versus with security groups. You can think about one way and what's allowed in goes out and vice versa. Another big difference between NACLs and security groups is that with security groups, everything is denied by default. So you can only specify allow rules. We'll talk about this and we'll show this, but if you have if you want to be able to log into an EC2 instance that you launched, you would use SSH to log into it. If you don't allow SSH through security groups, then the traffic will get blocked. You have to specifically go in and say, I want to allow SSH traffic from anywhere or from specific IP addresses in order for me to be able to SSH into it because by default it is denied. On the other hand, with NACLs, by default it is allowed. So I wouldn't have to go into the NACL and say, go ahead and 
and allow SSH, it will already do that by default unless I go in and decide to shut that down. And we'll look at that with the default VPC and what permissions are allowed with that, that default VPC being the one that AWS creates on your behalf uh, when you create your account. So every single account starts with a default VPC just to make it easier for beginners to, to get started. So those are some of the differences between security groups and, and ACLs. Are there any questions so far before we move on to other topics? All right, so I think you kind of hit a chord with some people. It's not really test related, but since we're doing so good on time, I'm going to go ahead and ask. They had a few questions of when it came to logs. Like, how do you interact with them when it comes to the AWS environment? We had some people asking if they could use Elasticsearch and maybe an old school admin in here saying, could I actually open them up and just awk and said my way through them? That's a really good question. I'm not gonna answer right now because frankly, I haven't done a whole lot with flow logs myself, so I don't wanna lead you astray. Uh, but also that is definitely going to be outside the scope of the exam, they don't go as deep into that. So what would be awesome though is if you can sync up with me in the Slack channel, I can talk to some of my colleagues that have more experience with flow logs and we can try to answer some of those questions because they're really good questions. All right, I think we're good to continue now. Fantastic. This is a really good chart that I reference all the time, especially when studying for exams, which is some of those differences we talked about between NACLs and security groups. And it just kind of lays it out side by side. Again, operates at instance level, operates at subnet level. Basically, it's the what is security groups versus what is NACLs. This is a really good reference sheet to keep in mind that you can find on uh, or in the AWS documentation by searching for NACL versus security groups in the AWS stocks. All right, let's do a quick VPC recap before you jump on to pop quiz questions and then jump into the console. But the reason I'm pulling this back up is because now we can look at this with a little bit of a different lens. We talked about the internet gateway that allows traffic to and from the open internet into your public subnets. Then we have the private subnets. In this case, they've created two different public or private subnets, one to host your databases and one to host your application instances that scale up and down depending on demand, and you have these load balancers. But if you think about this from the security perspective with the flow logs that we were just mentioning, flow logs will track and see what traffic is going to where in your VPC. And then you have those network access control lists that you can attach to these, these subnets. So for traffic to go to this subnet, it has to go through an NACL. You could have a different NACL for the private subnet here for this one as well. And then you have the security groups for your instances that are attached to those instances. And so again, it flows from the open internet or from your on-premises data center into these resources, has to go through those NACLs, then it has to go through the security groups before it can even reach your instances. And so if you think about that, that's a lot of different layers that one, you have to configure properly. So this is not something you can just throw together really quickly. You have to think through it strategically, who needs access, where, how, and so on, but also it's a lot of areas where you can make mistakes. If you're not following the proper protocols or best practices, you will make mistakes and then hackers will look for those mistakes. And once they find them, they'll be able to slip in and then you have an issue on your hands. So these are very, very important concepts to keep in mind as you're working with these resources. But also on the other hand, there is a lot at your disposal to make sure that the, uh, your, your resources are secure. And if we think back to the shared responsibility model, pretty much everything that we've talked about today is your responsibility. So you can't make a mistake in your NACL, get hacked, and then blame AWS for it. That's 100% in your control because AWS has given you that access and the resources you need to properly secure your resources. So you have to train, you have to do your homework in order to make sure that you don't have those issues. So that's the recap for VPCs. Let's go ahead and jump into pop quizzes. You've configured a VPC with public and private subnets, but your engineers are complaining that certain software packages are outdated and they're unable to connect to the internet in order to download updates. Which of these could be causing this issue? And you do have two options to select here. Is it your private subnets aren't routing traffic through an internet gateway? You added deny rules in the security group blocking downloads. You added deny rules in the NACL blocking downloads or your private subnets are not routing traffic through a NAT gateway. All right, we'll give you guys a few minutes to answer. I'm going to pop back on for those of you that joined us a little bit late. These are the swag items that you guys are, I don't want to say competing for, but will win if you get the answers right. And uh, thanks to our friends at Jupiter Broadcasting for donating those. And let's see the answers that we currently have. Wow, uh, we have DNA, 
B and C, A and D. So, so far, the only thing I can say is it's definitely not B. <laughs> Man, I thought people would be selecting B. I'm surprised. I'm happy about it, but yeah, I thought for sure I'd trip people up there. All right, so what are the correct two answers, Kristoff? C and D. Yeah, so it's not B, right? And, and I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad you didn't select B because you can't add deny rules to security groups. There, everything's denied by default. You can only allow things through security groups. But you could have added a deny rule through the NACL blocking downloads, or your private subnets are not routing traffic through the NAT gateway. The reason it's not A is because you don't want your private subnets to route traffic through an internet gateway. Again, for private subnets, you want that stuff to go through the NAT gateway so that it blocks requests coming from the open internet, uh, but you're still allowed to go out of your VPC versus the internet gateway would allow people to discover your resources in the private subnet. But yes, it would also solve the, uh, the issue, but that's not the best practice. So that's why it's not A. Awesome. Next one is you have on-premises resources that need to communicate with your AWS VPC resources. And so you need to create a connection. Which of the following can help you accomplish this? Again, you're going to select two this time. All right, guys. Let's see if we can salvage it this time since we had no winner last time. Um, anyway, I'll go ahead and up the ante for everyone and uh, bring in one of our It's OK to be new stickers. So it's a three pack now. Hopefully we get some winners. They're going to start getting these wrong just so I keep adding stickers to the... <laughs> All right, we've got some answers coming in. And once again, no one is agreeing. We've got uh, Byton, Bitten. But I really should know how to say this name as much as we talk. A and D. We've got D and E. B and A, A and C. So they're kind of spreading <laughs> their bets and just guessing everything. <laughs> Smart, um, smart people. Yep. So we have now had someone choose all of them. So what's our answer? <laughs> All of the above. I said select two, but all of the above. No. <laughs> so in this case, I did select C, virtual private gateway, and E, AWS Direct Connect as the answers because we're talking specifically about on-premises resources that need to communicate with your AWS VPC resources. And so you're creating that connection between on-prem and AWS VPC. And from these answers, the best options would be to, again, create that virtual private gateway, connect that to the customer gateway, and put a, an AWS Direct Connect in the middle between those two. The NAT gateway would be for, again, your, your private resources to reach out to the internet. So not, not really, I mean, that could technically work, but not really applicable in this case. And VPC endpoints and gateway endpoints are kind of one and the same. And those are really to be used for your resources to be able to access other AWS resources like S3, Route 53, Code Commit, and other services like that. Not so much for on-premises resources that you have. Hopefully that makes sense. Yep, we had one winner. So make sure to check your DMs for how to get your swag. And I, I love that people try to give the answer after you've given it <laughs> and celebrate. <laughs> Hoping you don't see it, right? Right. <laughs> All right, I've got seven minutes left. Let's go ahead and jump into the console really quickly because I do want to show you some of the concepts that we talked about in practice in the AWS console. I've already created a running instance so I can show you what that looks like when you SSH into it for the sake of time. But let's create a brand new EC2 instance. So if you're logging into your console, you would go in and search for EC2. You click on EC2, you land on that dashboard. Let me go back to it. EC2 dashboard, you have all these different options. A lot of these we talked about. But in this case, EC2 dashboard, and then launch instance. And as soon as I click that, I go through step number one. Step number one is choosing an Amazon machine image, or AMI, as I like to call them. AMIs contain software information. So think of this as like an image or a picture of a certain state that you are then creating a server off of. So in this case, we're going to select the first one, which is Amazon Linux 2 AMI. That comes with five years of support. It provide, provides Linux kernel 4.14, tuned for optimal performance on using EC2, system CD, et cetera, et cetera, and the latest software packages through extras. So this tells you a little bit about what's pre-baked into the server that you're going to be launching. If, on the other hand, you want Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, you can launch that image instance. If you want Ubuntu Server 18.04, you can also launch that. Uh, Microsoft Windows Server 2019, you can do that as well. There's a lot of different options, and these are part of the quick start, which are created by AWS themselves. But you could also create your own AMIs. You can go out to the marketplace. 
and you can sometimes they're free but oftentimes you have to pay an extra fee for these like if you want to run trend micro deep security barracuda cloud gen firewalls for aws basically these are third parties that have come in and said we have created images for you to use our software to help security or, or do all kinds of different use cases you can see at the bottom here and the AWS marketplace is where those resources live. So you can easily access those and it just adds on to your, to your EC2 bill. So whatever that fee for the EC2 instance is, plus the bill for whatever ser service you're running via the marketplace. And then you have community AMIs. So you and I can create AMIs, we can make them public, and then you can uh, use them through this community AMI area. Of course, you'll wanna do your due diligence here because I'm just not, I'm not going to use uh, L's AMI, no, no matter how much I like you, L, if you send me an AMI, I'm going to investigate and make sure it's secure because who knows what kind of software you could put on it. So that is something to keep in mind when you use community AMIs. In this case, we're going to use this first, EC, this first AMI here. Once I tell AWS what AMI I want to run on my, my EC2 instance, I also need to tell it what instance type I want to run. So we talked about this a little bit before. You have all kinds of different instance types. I mean, there, are, there is a ton of these available in AWS, and all of them have different specs, such as virtual CPUs. This is the compute resources that you get for it. Memory, one gigabyte, two, 0.5, two, four, all the way to, I don't even know, but they they're get really, really big. It's a lot of memory you can have access to. So depending on your use cases, you might need more or less CPU, you might need more or less memory, and so on. There's even graphic or GPU-based instances that are optimized for your GPU use cases. Uh, and, and you can also select the instance storage. In this case, it's called EBS, but there are other types of instance storage with SSDs and things like that. So there's a lot of customizability that you can look at when you're creating your EC2 instance here. Oops, I'm actually gonna go back to T2 Micro. But to me, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Now you have to configure your instance details. The first option you have is the number of instances. In this case, we're only launching one, but I could launch 10, I could launch 50, 100. There are some limits, but again, AWS is quote unquote infinitely scalable. So you can always reach out to them and say, hey, up my limits, I need more resources. And if you have the proper use case, they'll let you do it. But in this case, I could launch multiple different instances and I can also launch them in what's called an auto scaling group. An auto scaling group will take this configuration of this instance that I'm creating, and it will, based on your parameters, launch however many instances it needs to to fulfill a requirement. So if I tell auto scaling that I always want to have 10 of these instances running at all times, even if an instance fails for whatever reason, auto scaling will make sure that another one replaces it with identical configurations. So this is another way of getting the high availability. And again, if you create those subnets across multiple availability zones and you set up auto scaling properly, it will launch resources uh, symmetric symmetrically in those subnets and availability zones to increase that high availability and fault tolerance. So this is pretty neat and interesting as well. We talked about spot instances. You could request spot instances. In this case, I'm not going to do that, but you can do that. Then comes the networking part. So we've been talking a lot about VPCs. In this case, I have a default VPC. This is the VPC that AWS created for me to make it easier, excuse me, for beginners to be able to launch resources. But really, I'm only going to use this just to, to try AWS out. If I'm going to run any type of workload on AWS, I need to create my own VPC. And let me see if I can do that in a different tab, yeah. So I'll create my own VPC. I'll go into the VPC dashboard. I'll set up that VPC. I'll set up the subnets and so on until I have my desired VPC to launch these resources inside of it. But in this case, for sake of time, we're going to use the default VPC. Then I can select the subnets. So in this case, I have one, two, three, four, five, six subnets all across different availability zones. And because we are in the North Virginia re region, we do have that many availability zones. Not all regions will have this number of availability zones. So it depends on the region. But in this case, they did create one for every single AZ. I can auto assign a public IP address because this is these are all public subnets, the way that AWS set it up for us. But again, usually you wouldn't want just all public subnets. And before I move on, I do notice that we are going to be running out of time. So what I will say really quickly, and if you are interested in, in continuing to watch uh, the rest of me setting up this EC2 instance, please stick around. I'm not going to shut it off. I don't know, Al, if you have to go anywhere, but I don't. So I'll just keep going for a little bit. Uh, but if you do have to go somewhere or if you are running out of time, please make sure you download 
the slideshow. We sent an email prior to the to the meetup. We'll be sending another one afterward, afterwards as a follow-up. Download these slides. Make sure you look over these concepts. And I do have some homework to go through here, including if you do have a Linux Academy membership, you can go through two hands-on labs that demonstrate a lot of what we talked about. For next study group, which is in two weeks, make sure you study S3, AWS databases, and ElastiCache, and also download the sample AWS exams questions and answer number one, two, and three, which you should be able to do based on what we talked about. But again, if you're able to stick around, uh, please do so. We, we will be wrapping up probably in the next five to 10 minutes here. And anybody who has to go, please know that the um, recorded version of this will be about available about 10 minutes after we're done. So definitely just come back and watch. So I'm going to skip placement group. That's a more advanced uh, topic. Same thing with capacity reservation. IAM role, this comes back to the prior study group that we had. So you can create these IAM rules, roles, excuse me, with permissions so that your EC2 instance or instances have the proper permissions to access other resources, like in this case, be able to read data from Amazon S3. I created this role prior to the session, but again, we walked through how to create roles. So hopefully this rings some bells and this will give EC2, this instance, access to S3 read write, or read access, I mean. There are some other uh, settings like monitoring where you can enable CloudWatch detailed monitoring. It shows you monitoring about the EC2 resource, like the resources you're using on the instance and things like that. We'll be talking about CloudWatch in a future study group. We'll skip these and we'll skip this as well because it is more advanced. Then you have the storage. So this is where those EBS volumes that we, we briefly touched on come into play. So think of EBS volumes as solid state drives or hard drives, if you're more familiar with that. They can plug into your instance or multiple instances in order to give it more storage and better performance. And this storage is persistent. So it's there even if you turn off or terminate that instance, as long as you detach it from the instance. So if you have data that needs to stick around and not be quote unquote ephemeral, you can use these EBS volumes to store that information, just like you would use a hard drive in your computer. Store that info, turn off the computer, you turn it back on, it's still there. That's essentially what EBS volumes are here for. You do have the ability to encrypt data on the EBS volumes, but by default, it is not encrypted. Think back to the shared responsibility model. It is your responsibility to make sure that you're encrypting data if you need to encrypt that data. There is more information about EBS volumes, but that really comes into play with more advanced certifications. Tags, you are able to add tags with a key value pair. So I could say, you know, web servers for this project, database servers for this project, and so on. Helps me organize them and tag them. And then comes into play the security groups. So I do have existing security groups, but I can also create brand new security groups. Here is where I control what traffic goes in and out of my EC2 instances. Remember, by default, everything is denied with security groups. So if I want to be able to SSH into this instance, I will have to allow SSH. And I can do that via, for example, an IP range. So I could say a custom IP and I can type it into here. I could say anywhere around the world, or I could say my IP. I'm not going to do my IP because I don't really want you to see my IP, but that usually is a best practice so that even if this is publicly available via a public subnet, it'd be very, very hard for somebody to get access to your EC2 instance, at least from using SSH, because you're blocking connections outside of your IP range. So they would have to get access to your IP in order to be able to SSH into it. So that adds a, another layer of security. So we'll attach this security group to that EC2 instance, and then we'll go ahead and launch it. When we launch it, it asks for a key pair that's a public key and private key file that you can store on your computer. And that's what you use to SSH into the instance, which again is another layer of security. If they don't have access to your private key file, they won't be able to SSH into your instance, even if you didn't set up the right security groups. So we'll go ahead and launch that with a key pair that I've created prior to this, uh, to this session. And again, because this does take a little bit of time to initialize, it is booting up a server after all. So it's kind of like booting up your computer. It can take a couple of minutes. I've already created one. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and SSH into it. So I've got a terminal window open. You can use PuTTY and other tools like that. And I'll go ahead and SSH into that instance. Now I have full access to this Amazon Linux AMI. As a root user, I can use sudo to gain uh, elevated privileges. I can run updates. I can install software. I can basically do whatever I want because this is my server. As long as I'm not violating AWS Terms of Service, I can pretty much do whatever I want with it. And that's what an EC2 instance can do. Christoph, Any questions so far? Yes, yes uh, we were going to ask, can you modify the default SSH port? 
That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I think you would have to, I mean, once you, once you launch the instance, mm -hmm. if you know how to do that, which I don't know that I've ever personally done that myself, but yes, you would be able to change it. But when you're launching the instance, you don't have, you don't have a field to do that, if that makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? I think that's it. One other cool thing you can see here when you select these instances and you, is you get some extra details and descriptions. So status checks, how is this instance doing? Some of the monitoring, this is with CloudWatch. Again, we'll talk about this in a future study group. But if you look at the description here, you'll see there's a public IP address that was automatically assigned since this is part of a public subnet. There's also public DNS that you can use. And when I SSH, I usually use the public DNS, but you can get more information about uh, these by hovering over these little fields. You also get private IP address and private DNS. You can see which VPC it was launched inside of, which subnet in that VPC it was launched inside of. You can see which security group it's using. You can look at the inbound and outbound rules. You can see which availability zone. You basically get all kinds of information through the console, but you can also do this with that, uh, via the API calls, CLI calls, SDK calls that we talked about in a prior study group. This is all API based. So even though I see it here visually, I can also pull this information programmatically as well. Let's dive into the security groups real quick. Then I'll dive into the NACLs and then we'll wrap it up. So just to see what that security group groups looks like, even though I've already created it, you can look at the inbound and outbound rules. You'll see the outbound is all traffic is allowed. Inbound, only SSH is going to be allowed right now. So if I were to run a web server over port 443 for HTTPS, I would have to allow that traffic. Otherwise, the security group would block all requests. And so your web server would be kind of worthless. Same thing with the NACL. So if I go over to the VPC dashboard and go to network access control lists, I will see that they've automatically created one for my default VPC. And in this, I've got the inbound rules and the outbound rules. All traffic is allowed in and out, which again, you would really want to create your own VPC with your own NACLs in order to lock that down further so that not all traffic is allowed inside and out. But again, keep in mind, you can create inbound and outbound rules and have them behave differently. You can also see which subnets it's associated with. So unless there are any questions about this or what we just walked through, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up. And hopefully this was really helpful for everyone. If you do have any questions, again, please join the Slack channel so that we can follow up uh, with your questions there. And otherwise, make sure that you take a look at this homework here. Join our community on Lynx Academy. Join the Slack channel on Lynx, for Lynx Academy. And see you next time. This is the wrong date. I forgot to update this. This is today's date. So check the GitHub repo by clicking here in order to see the, the next dates that we have. All Thanks right. to everybody. And if you found this helpful, please invite your colleagues. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I've also went ahead and created the next two study groups on Meetup, so you can join us there. Mark Richmond was kind enough to join us in our Twitch chat today, so he said he will be available for further questions in the Linux Academy Slack as well, including the answer to our parsing logs. So there's reason to join us there. Thanks everyone, Thank and we'll see you in two weeks. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.